listening to that. Um, very end, the last time we started talking about kinematics, I went past the, and today we're going to go into the gory details of talking about kinematics. Some of you think might think it's a math class for the next couple lectures. It's not meant to be that. And I don't expect anybody to do any derivation based on what I'm going through. But my point today is to take you through concepts of kinematics, a little bit about what the mathematical basis, or the physical basis, really more than the, than the mathematical basis, but there's a math behind it, as an illustration of what quantities are that are involved in kinematics. And the, the first two are relatively straightforward that we talked about last time, is that you can describe motion. The simplest type of motion are the two different rigid body motions. So the material, if you take an object from point A to point B, you can translate it or just simply move it from point A to point B, and you can rotate it. And both of those quantities are represented by a vector. This is less obvious that this is a vector, but that's the thing I ended with last time. You get your right hand out in a right hand rule, and the sense of rotation is the, uh, is the vector, and the magnitude of the vector is the amount of rotation that will be in that particular circuit. Okay. I already said that, so I can skip that. Uh, general kinematics includes another component of that motion. Uh, and that motion I'm going to refer to initially as distortion, or you could also call it deformation. Uh, the first of those components is what I'll refer to here as homogeneous distortion. And homogeneous distortion. Is, a quant is the quantity called strain, or finite strain. And in the simplest sense, you can take a, an object and distort it. It's homogeneous distortion because the line elements that make up this distortion remain straight from point A to point B, or from the undeformed to the deformed condition. The second part of distortion that could be involved, however, is a volumetric change. And that could be both a decrease or an increase in volume. Uh, and that's illustrated here schematically as, the, as a decrease in volume. Uh, both of those are beyond the, the rigid body effect. And their quantification is a little tricky. Volumetric distortions are actually fairly common in geology, although they're really hard to quantify in most cases. But can any, anybody read ahead on these and know some examples of this? Or what would be an example of a geologic process? That, yeah, sorry? The extraction of H2O, maybe? That's one. You remove water. The dehydration of sediments is an example. And which material loses mass? Drying of mud and uh, solidification of basalt. Same, same kind, yeah. Solidification of basalt. Yeah, that's a slight volumetric change by thermal, uh, thermal contraction. That's correct. Can you think of anything else? What, how about something called the volumetric increase? Volumetric change. What's that? The, the bio part, is that what you're talking about? No, no, what's, what would be a volumetric, what might cause an increase? Strain. Local. Remember, Tracking. strain is all local. Huh? Tracking. Tracking is local. Well, that would do it. That's a sort of a artificial example mm -hmm. of kind of what I was thinking of, where you're injecting material into something and forcing it to expand. Uh, there's a common geologic process that does Hydrothermal that. events? Right here. That's the most common one. Mm -hmm. There's igneous intrusions. Uh, if you have igneous intrusion, you have to force a volume change, at least locally, at the site of the intrusion. Uh, the ultimate example of that will come back a little bit later when we talk about um, a little bit in terms of tectonics. But the perfect example of that is at the ocean floor when you have some sort of spreading. There's dike, 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 and ovulite succession. The rock is 100% dike rock, and all the strain is volumetric by magma coming in and forming new ocean crust uh, it, it, by that particular process. The other one is vein formation, and a vein is just a, a filled fracture. We'll come back to that later. But if you have a rock that, it, that's full of veins, it's obviously expanded in volume the veins fill a void, uh, and the rock has gotten larger by the influx of veins. And so uh, both that's really, since it's hydrothermal as an example, that would be an example of that kind of thing. And then he already said these, these are just examples 
Um, but there's, a, there's also a volume loss by deformation that we'll spend a bunch of time on a little bit later, which is a process called pressure solution. And that occurs on a slightly different mechanism than simply the catch in the sediment. But those are volumetric changes. Uh, the other displacement component is the one we'll spend most of our time about, and that's the quantity that we call strain, or finite strain in particular. So we'll start with kind of a, as I said, this is sort of a math interview. What are stress and strain, right? And the answer is they aren't vectors. And I'll give you a couple of demonstrations of that a little bit later, especially when we talk about stress, uh, which is a little easier to demonstrate that characteristic. But to get to there, let's first talk about quantities, or different kinds of quantities. Scalars, vectors, tensions, and so forth, what are they? You're all familiar with scalars and vectors. You've worked with them all through school. Uh, you started with arithmetic, which is scalars, right? Uh, but what do I mean by a quantity called a tensor? Um, th it turns out that they are all part of the same mathematical concept. You start usually introduced to it that way because it gets too complicated to, to deal with it in that context. Uh, but so before we get there, what are these two quantities? What is a scalar? A scalar has magnitude. It has magnitude, and only magnitude, right? It's a number. What about a vector then? It has direction. It has direction and magnitude. magnitude. So it has, it has two different kinds, two different kind of features that characterize it. And so there we've got that relationship right there. So now I'll put the light back on. Scalar <coughs> operations and vector operations are things that you're semi-familiar with, as I said. Scalar operations are just arithmetic. You learned that in grade school. Vector operations require vector sums and the oddball kinds of products that we'll deal with here. We're going to work our way into another type of which are things called second order tensors, uh, which use another type of math. But in reality, it's just the, it's the general math of vectors that most of you have not been introduced to. Uh, so now you've got to put up with my bad handwriting. 